it was September 24th, 2000. And I had been, for the last two to three weeks, rocketing into mania and diving down into depression with the paranoia and the hallucinations in between. And leading up to the 24th of September, 2000, I was so depressed. I remember, I remember I would go to my bathroom by myself, look in the mirror. I would loathe everything I saw. I would hate myself with every fiber of my being. And, and, and I would talk to myself as if I was two different people. It was, it was almost violent. It was horrific. And then I would, I would stop and realize what was happening. I'd say, I don't want to die. I'm a good person. I don't want this to end this way. And so on the 24th, my, my father got home from work. He was in his room doing business, you know, on the phones and such for, for his company. And, and I, I exited the bathroom and I was in my room and it was crystal clear. The belief that I had to die. I kept saying, I don't want to die. And then I kept saying, you have to die. And I got online, and, you know, it, there are evil people in this world, and I believe that to be so, because I was online, and I went onto a, a website, I typed in one word, one word, and these websites came up that told people, whoever you are, whatever you're doing, wherever you're going in life, you should die, because, because on that site, it said, if you live in San Francisco, and you go to the Golden Gate Bridge and you jump off, you will die on impact, good luck, exclamation point. That is out there. It's horrible. And for a person in my position, in my sickness, that broke me. And I decided that is what I have to do. I'd keel over in pain, physical pain, because of my brain. Some people don't understand that to be real. And so there I am in my room on the 24th. I wrote a suicide note to my family, my friends, and my girlfriend at the time. I told them I loved them. I told them I was sorry. I asked for their forgiveness. I stayed up in my room hallucinating that night, having night terrors. My son will be fine. I'll just go in and check on him which he did when I pretended I was asleep. But then the next morning, 7 a.m., he came in my room. He was still very worried. He still didn't just, you know, he knew something was up. I said, Kevin, I'm really worried about you. Do you, need to, do you. do you want to go to work with me today? Just stay in my office, hang out? No, no, Dad, I've got, got so much to do. By this time, I was calm, which is another sign. If, some, if a child, a young youth is acting so inner, erratic and unbelievably overtly uh, challenging, difficult, uh, and then it flips off like a switch, you need to ask questions. And, and one of those questions my father should have asked, which he should have been uh, required to ask by my doctor, I think, was, are you having thoughts of suicide, Kevin? Are you thinking of harming yourself? Kevin, do you have a plan once you got that answer, yes or no? Do you have a plan? What is that plan? When do you plan to take that plan, to put that plan into action? Kevin, I think we need to go to the hospital. I'm going to take you there. I know. I know and people have challenges, but I know. Had my father asked me the direct question at least twice, I would have broken down and told him. Because in my head, I wanted people to know. My father never asked that question. To no fault of his own, he's an economist. He's not a psychologist. He's not a doctor. He's not a clinician. He's not even a counselor. He did what he could. And he was close. Kevin, I want to take you to work with me. Kevin, let's go to the movies. Kevin, we'll go wherever you want, he said. Just stay with me today. I was the thorn in everybody's side. On that, on that bus, it's a big bus. Uh, you know, you get down the stops on Park Presidio and every, every, it's filled up to the brim. 
there's probably probably 60 people sitting down and 40 to, 40 to 50 people standing. And I'm in the back, like in the seat, I'm in the back row, in the middle, looking out upon everyone. And that's when I became ambivalent. What does that mean? Yes, I felt I had to die, but I desperately wanted to live. And I made a pact with myself. And this is something, if, you, if you're trained enough and you, you look around you, you can see that I made a pact with myself that if one person looks at me and says, are you okay, is something wrong, or can I help you? One of those things or a simple variation of the three, and I had decided that I was going to tell them my whole life story. But it was, it was there that I thought, somebody please say something, but I couldn't say it to them. I couldn't be the one to break that silence and tell my truth and get help. Now my father was right there at my house, giving me his arm, and I couldn't take it because I was not yet ambivalent. I couldn't take it because he didn't say, Kevin, are you thinking of suicide? And instead, as I sometimes say a typical San Francisco muni driver, he said, come on, kid, get off the bus. I got to go. Took a deep breath, got off the bus, took another deep breath. But now, now I was having that hallucinatory voice in my head. So I picked a particular spot for no apparent reason, just. And then this woman approached me. Beautiful woman, giant sunglasses. And uh, assuming the sun was in her eyes, as I'm standing, I'm leant over the rail crying. Uh, and she said, excuse me, will you take my picture? And I, would, I wanted to do a nice thing before I died, so I took a picture several times. She walked away and said, thank you, and walked away. That moment, I muttered, nobody cares. I swore as well, but I'm not going to repeat that. Nobody cares. Then the voice one last time, jump now, threw myself over the rail. Falling in free fall. And I always say this and because it's fact. The millisecond both my hands and feet left that rail. What have I done? The voice in my head was gone from my mind. What have I done? I don't want to die. God, please save me. Then I hit. An impact that reverberated through my legs into my lower back, shattering my T12, L1, and L2 vertebrae, splintering them like shards of glass. And deep in that water, probably 70 to 80 feet, I opened my eyes. I was alive. What the hell do I do now? I'm going to drown. And I thought my, my, it was ridiculous, but the thought was, the website didn't say you could drown, but, but I opened my eyes. <clears throat> and I fought to get to the surface. It wasn't easy because I initially was going down. My ears were ringing. My eyes were bulging out of my head. I was going down. I realized it. I turned around and shot for the service. You have to understand, my legs were completely immobile. I couldn't move them. But I fought to get to that surface. And I prayed, God, please save me. I don't want to die. In the water, bobbing up and down, swallowing salt water, something brushed by my legs. And my immediate thought was, oh, this, is, this is ridiculous. I'm going to get devoured by a shark. And I didn't die jumping off of that bridge, but a shark is going to eat me. And years later, uh, on an ABC primetime show, I found out that it was no shark. It was a sea lion. My life was spared that day. I'm thankful to be alive every day. And I have a different perspective than most. 
But if I can do this, a person that deep and down and in that much pain can, can find wellness, I believe everyone can.